You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. <laughs> Welcome back to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that is not your history class. With me, your damaged host, Katie Charlwood, chicken nugget enthusiast and reader of books. It has been such a busy week. I've barely had time to stop. It is. It has been hectic. I'm in the process of getting stuff ready for decorating. The kids' beds have arrived. I'm very excited. And I want to apologise again, my throat, my voice still isn't back to normal, but we're just going to power through and hope for the best. And I just want to thank everybody, everybody who has been giving those Apple podcast reviews. They really, really help. Like, they really do. They help on the back end. And and I'm like charting in Brazil. Brazil. Okay, right? Yeah, Weird. But also pretty cool. And don't forget, if you like the podcast and you want to support the podcast, uh, feel free to review on Apple Podcasts. And it doesn't matter what you say. um, As long as you say something, you could literally be like, I like bananas. Or I dislike bananas in pyjamas because they don't need pyjamas. It doesn't matter. Your, Your statement doesn't even need to revolve around fruit. And if you are looking to support the podcast, you can always go to Patreon and you can get like a bunch of like extra stuff, extra content there. And that is patreon.com slash who did what now. Or if you don't want to provide financial support, which is absolutely fine, uh, you can always, uh, you know, follow on social media, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, um, everything is who did what now pod, apart from Twitter, which is who did what now PD. Speaking of TikTok, firstly, I really need to find the girls, gays and theys again because a lot of dude bros have just started commenting stuff with the deliberate intention of trying to ridicule and or upset me, which is super fun, obviously, but just like, why? Like, how sad do you need to be that your form of enjoyment is harassing people on the internet with the intention of upsetting them? Wh- what? But actually, something that came up on TikTok was I posted a video before about Gandhi, because on there I tend to talk about history that we either ignore or omit, or in general, stuff that doesn't really fall into white colonialist perceptions, really. And so on the Gandhi video, you know, I get people like, do Mother Teresa, do this person. I'm like, done them, done them, done them. And then somebody commented, do Winston Churchill. I was like, oh, my darling, welcome to the guild of historical descent. Like, we talk about Churchill here. We do. Do not be afraid. There was an actual series on Winston Churchill was human trash because he's just awful, so horrifically awful. But I know what you're saying. Quit your jibber jabber and fact me. In fact, you, I will. In fact. But first, we're going to get our source on. Today's episode is all about Joan of Arc because why not? I think it's time. And 
sources we have the trial of Joan of Arc that's the transcript from 1431 I also have the trial of Joan of Arc on famoustrials.com oh yeah that's my new favorite website Joan of Arc by La Purcell and also biography.com history.com historyextra.com and the smithsonian.com so let's get to it let's start from the beginning shall we so in france the hundred years war was raging it started in 1337 and it was basically between the house of plantagenet and the house of lancaster who ruled england and the house of valois who felt they had the right to the kingdom of france and bang smack in the middle of this conflict, Joan of Arc was born in France in 1412. And you know what, frankly, it's, it's good to actually have a year of birth. I'll take it. Her parents were Jacques Duc and Isabelle Romy, uh, who were farmers in Domremy, northeast France. Her parents were peasants and farmers, and she never learned to read or write because it wasn't really necessary for, you know, a pauper to actually have to read and write. But she learned, you know, basic things like taking care of animals and learning to sew. Although this would be more like practical sewing as opposed to the embroidery which sort of noble women would learn. So she was actually born Jeanette, but usually went by Jean, um, as in Jean Lapicelle, or Joan the Maid. So when Joan was 13, she started to have these, what some might refer to as auditory hallucinations. And she was sort of worried and scared by them at first. But then she starts trusting these voices. And one voice tells her, you know, to be a good girl and go to church often. Later, she starts having visions. So she sees the Archangel Michael, St. Catherine and then St. Margaret. And they show up and they basically tell her that she is the saviour of France. And she has to go to the heir to the French throne, the Dauphin Charles. And she has to get him to basically kick the English out of France. Joan, she really, really believes in these visions. She believes that she is, you know, having the whole Metatron thing and talking to the archangels. And so... She travels to, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, Vaucouleurs in May of 1428. And she speaks to Robert de Baudricourt, who was the garrison commander and a supporter of the Dauphin Charles. And he, you know, didn't really want to let this, what, 16-year-old, I think, at the time, go speak to the heir to the French throne. But... He changes his mind when she manages to come back the following January with two of Baudricourt's soldiers supporting her along with a bunch of townspeople. And he's like, okay, if she's gaining this much support, sure, you can have an armed escort to take you to the royal court at Chinon. And she manages to make a prediction about the Battle of Rouvray. I have definitely pronounced that wrong which she somehow knew because of divine grace. Now, knowing that she now has to go meet the Dauphin, she decides to chop her long dark hair off short and dress in men's clothes. And one of the reasons she actually wears men's clothing is it actually would be safer for her to travel as, you know, someone who looked like a man as opposed to a teenage girl travelling across France. But anyway, it takes Joan and her entourage about 11 days to finally land in Chinon, where Charles and his court were. Now, he decides to play a trick on her, and he hides in the crowd and acts like he's a normal member of the court. And she literally points him out, and she's like, yup, that's you, she wears wallies him. She's like, boom, there you go. Even though she'd never actually met him before, and Charles is kind of like, there's something weird here, he's a bit wary of her, and I think he's like 26 at this point, and she's 17, I think, 
And so he's like, get my theologians to look at her. And so they do. And they're like, no, she's fine. She's just devout and pretty single-minded. So she manages to meet the Dauphin and then wows him with information from her visions. So she manages to recite a prayer that he was secretly, silently thinking of and was also able to tell him the whereabouts of a sword that had been hidden behind a church's altar. Woo, spooky. So Charles and his mother-in-law, Yolande of Aragorn, they decide they're going to have this relief expedition to Orlan. And so Joan has to ask permission to, to go along and to go with the army and has to ask permission to have armour. So then a bunch of people actually donate um, items for her armour, her horse, her banner, her sword and a bunch of other items utilised by her entourage as well. And you have to remember at this point, they have had a humiliating defeat after defeat after defeat. And so they're like, fuck it. At this point, yeah. Why the fuck not? You can go do your thing, girl. Let's see how we get on. So she joins the battle in Orléans and she's on the front lines. And the French actually managed to take control of the English defences in a series of battles. And then Joan, she gets injured. But when it comes to the final charge, she actually returns to the battlefield. And this is where she actually gets the nickname, the Maid of Orleans. But you know what's really, really interesting is that she never actually kills anybody. Like, not one person does she kill. She doesn't really engage in battle, but she was more like this symbol. And she was there to sort of encourage and inspire the soldiers. And, you know, I mean, she held the banner and stuff, but also, you know, helped with war strategies. And she did, she did suggest some sort of peacemaking solutions to the English, which obviously they fucking rejected. And this is the thing as well, like, this is not the last time she gets injured in the midst of battle. So at one point she gets an arrow in her shoulder. Actually, no, I think it's both shoulders. She gets shot in each shoulder, but at different times. She gets a crossbow bolt in her thigh. And she falls from a siege ladder and she gets hit in the head with a fucking rock. So the Dauphin Charles and Joan, they're basically good buddies at this point because she is a very amazing symbol for France. She is a point of inspiration. So she keeps encouraging him to go get crowned king to have his coronation. And when he does actually go and do it, what does he have but the living embodiment of the symbol of France next to him? Joan. She is right by his side when that crown is laid upon his head in July 1429. It is then that the newly coronated King Charles the Seventh sends Joan to deal with the Burgundians in early 1430. So there is a battle and like Joan who apparently is more accident prone than Wiley Coyote when he's chasing Roadrunner like. So yeah, she's in the midst of this fucking battle, gets thrown from the horse and then she is left at the town of Compiègne's gates. So what happens? Well, what do you think happens? She gets taken hostage by, like, the townsfolk. And they're like, okay, we're going to start negotiating her release because she is a valuable commodity. But they don't negotiate with the French. Oh, no. They negotiate with the English. Um, because the English were like, this is valuable propaganda, like, because of course, of course they know this. So they manage to buy Joan of Arc from the Burgundians for 10,000 francs. And frankly, this is basically the beginning of the end for Joan. So while she's been taken prisoner by the Burgundians, she becomes 
incredibly anxious, like really, really fucking anxious to the point that she jumps from a tower in the castle where she is being held, which, you know, some people think it's because she was trying to escape. Um, but the other option is that she was trying to end her own life, which is a weird thing to do for somebody so devout. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So while this ransom situation is going on, King Charles VII is suspiciously absent during this. He is distancing himself from Joan. Because, in fairness, he got what he wanted. He was now King of France. He didn't really need her anymore. And he didn't try and intervene. He didn't try and stop this from happening or pay a ransom or try and retrieve her or have her released in any way. And when the ransom was paid and she was handed over to the English church officials, he did nothing. But kill surprise. So, the trial. So, there was like 70 counts filed against her in total. And these included witchcraft and heresy and sorcery. Which to me just sounds like witchcraft with a different title. But okay. And kind of like when you're trying to like bulk up an essay and you're like, uh, it was white and chalky and and pale and devoid of colour and you know what I mean like just trying to fill it up but anyway and one of the other counts was dressing like a man now this one's going to be important later on so while Joan is on trial this tribunal questions her like almost 12 times over like a month in early 1431 but she always claimed to be innocent of all the charges against her. And she is being held captive in this military prison. And she's still denying any guilt. Like she's still standing up for herself and still saying that everything she said is correct. And while she's in this prison, she is threatened with torture and abuse and 
even rape, which we really shouldn't be surprised at because she's a 19-year-old girl in a military prison. But for all the claims against her of heresy, she's like, nope, fuck this for a game of soldiers. God has always been my lord in all that I have done. Direct quote there, you're welcome. So one of the things they try and do is they try and say that like the voices that she was hearing were not the voices of angels, but just the voices of people. Like They wanted to say that people were telling her to do this and that she had heard other people and had mistaken it and she's like no the voices were angels they were messages from god because i am a fucking prophet behold well she didn't say it like that but she was saying that the voices were angels that she saw the angels and she heard the angels and they were fucking angels they were angels not people Eventually, though, Joan, the cracks start to show and it all gets a bit much and she does break. And she is offered life imprisonment if she admits that she's guilty and if she signs this document basically recanting that, you know, she was having visions, basically stating that she's not a prophet anymore and that this was all just something else. And she has to sign this document confessing her sins and pledging to change her heretical ways. But like a few, a few days later, Joan puts the male soldier's clothing that she was used to wearing, she puts that back on instead of anything sort of womanly clothing. So the question is... Was that the only clothing that was available to her? Or did she somehow sneak in her male soldier clothes and put that on? That's... Huh. But anyway, so she does that. She's in her regalia. She's in her gear. And she starts claiming to hear voices again. And... The judges of this trial and the tribunal are livid. They are mad. But they already have a document stating that she has confessed her sins and blah, blah, blah. So the only crime they actually pin on her, they do call her a relapsed heretic. But that's not the crime she's actually convicted of. The crime she's convicted of is cross-dressing. Like, that's the official thing. Although part of it was probably just they wanted to destroy the symbol of France. And part of it was just, you know, general sexism. Because, obviously. But she gets charged with cross-dressing. And that's the reason they burn her at the stake. So, her execution, the stake is set up at the marketplace in Rouen and there's about 10,000 people showing up to watch her, you know, be murdered and burned alive. So, the very last words in this 19 year old's life the last word she said was Jesus okay and so they light her up I'm assuming it was an excruciatingly painful death as burning is supposed to be and Because I'm assuming being engulfed by flames was probably not a great way to go. And would the smoke inhalation get her first? I don't... Would you die from shock or the burning or the smoke? What would kill you first when burned at the stake? What, what, What actually kills you? That's a... 
If there's a mortician who knows that answer, please, I'd, I'd let me know. It would be great. An anthropologist, maybe? Maybe? I don't know. Anyway, so after she is, you know, dead and appropriately flambéed, an English soldier says that, you know, they're lost. Shit, we've burned a saint. And there's a legend. Oh, my God. There is a legend that basically says that even though she was, you know, grilled, her heart survives the blaze intact. Like, there are a bunch of reasons why this could happen. But I think it was her heart, lungs and intestines didn't burn. So they actually cremated them two more times. So she was burned effectively thrice, thrice, um, and then thrown into the river. But what really was Joan seeing? So like modern day psychologists, they believe that Joan's visions were just like auditory and visual hallucinations. And what caused it, whether it was some form of schizophrenia or um, genetic epilepsy which like affects like a certain part of the brain we don't know because we don't we can't travel back in time and check it you know what I mean but yeah it is what it is and and like Joan she lived she was born she lived and she died during the hundred years war so the hundred years war is still going on and it actually continues for another 22 years after she dies. And Charles VII, he, he manages to keep his crown and his throne. And he orders this investigation regarding, you know, Joan's death. And in 1456, she is cleared of all the charges laid against her. And she is declared a martyr. And a couple hundred years later, uh, she's sort of seen as a saint. And she actually gets canonized in 1920 and is now the patron saint of France. It's nice when a patron saint is actually from the area. Because, like, Joan of Arc is the patron saint of France. St. George is... Where's St. George from? He's from somewhere else. And he's the patron saint of England. St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland. But he's something else. And was he Scottish? Was he from Cumbria? Was he Welsh? We don't fucking know. Nobody knows. But it is what it is. And that's absolutely fine. So because Joan was Joan, um, a bunch of people thought that she hadn't actually burned at the stake. Like she'd survived somehow. And so these imposters start popping up all over the place. Now, um, one of them is um, Claude de Amoise. I like to call her Claude the Fraud because I find that really, really funny because um, I like rhyming and puns. So Claude the Fraud is actually looks quite a bit like Joan, like a lot of Joans, the faux Joans. They sort of show up and they don't really look like her, but, you know, Claude does and she actually leads soldiers and she can ride horseback and a bunch of stuff that like other people couldn't do back then and so basically she meets up with Joan's brothers and well so the rumor is either either they convinced they were convinced that she was Joan or it was a scheme they all had together so it's one or the other we don't know eh and so she finally goes and meets um, King Charles and King Charles thinks it's Joan and Claude just suddenly, for some reason, in front of the king, grows a conscience and decides to actually tell him that, no, she's not actually Joan, um, she's Claude. And then Claude buggers off, gets married or goes back to her husband and we don't really hear from her again. And since her death, Joan of Arc has become a symbol. I mean, she, she was a living symbol and is now a dead symbol, but continuously symbolic. And she became like an icon for feminism 
and women's rights and uh, strangely enough she was the inspiration for the flapper style bob initially so like that was the inspiration and so she's inspired this look and there are makeup looks and things that are based around Joan of Arc and I'm pretty sure there's like I think there was a TV show Joan of Arcadia oh my goodness wow forgot about that so like there's a bunch of stuff based on her and kind of kind of lived through the ages so that's the that's the story of Joan of Arc what did we learn today well, we learned that if you help a man get a throne, he's still going to let you be burned to death. Super. Absolutely fun there. And, no, that's it. That's all I got for you. So, recommendations. What am I watching, listening, reading? Okay, listening to... I, I actually started listening to Southern Fried True Crime. I actually quite like her voice. It's pretty soothing, actually. So that's my podcast that I'm currently listening to. I sort of switch up between um, currently the Small Town Murder, Crime and Sports, My Favourite Murder, Southern Fried True Crime, and She Done It, which is a... uh, it's, It's based on mystery writers and stuff like that. It's That is a soothing voice. That is a relaxing, soothing voice to get you to sleep. And watching. I watched the finale of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It was so good. It was so good. Uh, and I, I quite like having a, an ambiguous character here and there. It's pretty fun. So, watching, listening, reading. I'm actually not reading anything this week. For once, I'm not reading anything because I've been too busy. I really should read more often, but I'm not doing it this time. Ah, it's a shame. It's a terrible shame. Actually, before I go, I want to mention that I saw somebody on TikTok make hash browns, but they soaked the potato in Guinness. And I don't even like Guinness, but honestly, I think this is worth trying. And I'm still mad the potato TikTok is not called Tater Talk because you've missed a trick there. I'm just saying. But with that being said, I am actually going to go because my throat is getting very sore. Um, But I am going to go and I shall chat to you next week. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.